Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of three online forums with Changemakers in Singapore. This forum is part of the larger Reimagining Singapore 2030 project by Institute of Policy Studies, where we look at how we can achieve happiness, prosperity, and progress for our nation in 2030 and beyond. At each forum, we will ask our special guests to tell us about the change that has taken place in their domains of work over recent years, the change they hope to see over the next decade, and their reflections on the processes to effect positive social change in our country. The series will result in a report on the process of change making and inform the final recommendation phase of Reimagining Singapore 2030. Now, before I give a brief introduction of our esteemed guests, here are some housekeeping details. The session, just in case you don't know, the session is being streamed live on Facebook. It will be recorded and uploaded on IPS website and Facebook, uh, and Facebook page later. Please submit your comments and questions at any time through our Facebook comment section. I will try my best to fill your questions to the panelists. Now, speaking of the panelists, I'm really honored to have with me today four very experienced and esteemed experts representing different facets of well-being and belonging. The theme of today's forum. In no particular order, here are our change makers. Joining us today all the way from UK, Mr. John Gee. John is a former president and until recently, the head of Transient Workers Count Tools or TWC Tools Research Subcommittee. TWC Two is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving conditions of low-wage migrant workers in Singapore. He has lived in Singapore since about 1999 when he married a Singaporean who he had first met in university about 20 years earlier. Next, we have Professor Chong Yap Seng, the Lian Ying Chao Professor in Medicine and Dean of the National University of Singapore's Yong Lulin School of Medicine and the Chief Clinical Officer of the Singapore Institute of Clinical Sciences at ASTAR. Prof Chong is also obstetrician and the lead principal investigator of the Growing Up in Singapore Towards Healthy Outcomes Study, Augusto for short, as well as a member of the Child and Maternal Health Task Force, Task Force Work Group. Then we have Ms. Susanna Harding. Susanna has been in Singapore for over 20 years and is currently the Senior Director at the International Longevity Centre, Singapore, an initiative of the South Foundation. Susanna is involved in the Foundation's Community for Successful, Successful Aging, or COMSA. Since 2013, she has led the development and implementation of COMSA in Wampo community. In 2019, her team has been piloting a community empowerment program called Empower, or enriching and mobilizing participation of Wampo's elderly, elderly presidents. Last and certainly not least, Mr. Farid Abdul Hamid, a diversity facilitator with Itika Private Limited, an organization he established in, in 2007 with two decades of experience in public service and civil society. He is an internationally experienced practitioner, trainer, and educator in the field of experiential learning with over 30 years in the field. He's closely associated with successful programs in inter-ethnic and inter-religious engagement and understanding, as well as in diversity and inclusivity here in Singapore. He has trained over 860 intercultural and interfaith dialogue facilitators. While they seemingly represent different areas of work, as a researcher who studies and writes about race and disadvantaged communities, as a father of a young child, and as someone who loves his aging family members dearly. The topics discussed today are very close to my heart indeed. And I'm sure you will find a lot of value listening, interacting uh, with these change makers, with your questions. We hope the broad range of domains and the different methods each of them has adopted in bringing about positive social change will set us thinking about our own journeys in change making and reimagining a happier and progressive Singapore. We'll need your questions and comments to get the most of our time together. I will begin to fill the questions at around 4.45. Now, do not allow me to monopolize the questions. Please ask away. Now, without further ado, my name is Shamil Zanuddin of IPS, your moderator for today, and let's begin. Now, first and foremost, Farid, Prof Chong, Susanna, and John, thank you for all your service, for doing the work to improve all our lives for all these many years, and thank you for giving us your time today. Now, while we wait for members of the audience to send their questions, I have some questions to ask all of you. Now, the first is, can you all talk to us about the most significant changes that have taken place in your area of work or activism over the past years? What role did you or your organization, you, did you or your organization play in that? 
we are basically trying to understand uh, what changing and change making entails. Um, I'll begin with Farid. Now, Farid, the topic of dealing with race and religion and how it relates to our multicultural living has always been a hot topic, but I think it seems hotter recently. Uh. With the many stories about racism or xenophobia, what are your thoughts on changes we have seen over the years and what part have you played in this change? Farid, please. Sweet. Thank you, Shamil. Thank you. It's really a, a pleasure to be here amongst our friends here and, and the guests that have just come in or started to come in. Um, the work that I do specifically um, is about um, nurturing and, 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 and holding that safe space for, for dialogue. And when I say dialogue, it's not debate, it's really dialogue. And, and I think a lot of Singaporeans struggle with the idea of dialogue because you know, we're so used to debate in school. And so the way we listen and the way we inquire and the mindset that we get into a dialogue is a very different one to be. We don't have time for that today. But just to go straight into your question. And, and what I do is I, I, I train facilitators to hold or create that safe space um, so that um, people are, are, are com more comfortable being vulnerable and, and sharing their perspectives. And so I guess uh, what, how I see myself contributing to the whole sort of um, mosaic of, of, of initiatives is, is that people to people or person to people connections or person to person connections. Um, and, and, and to me, uh, it's also about storytelling. Uh, and the stories that are being shared, the stories that are being told, are the stories of the people in the circle, right? When I say I'm sorry, I think we got a cut off a bit for it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, you can continue. I think we, you just got a bit of a... Uh, okay now? Inter yeah, you, I can hear you, Corey. Okay, so, uh, and, and the size of the circles, I did say the word circles can be as small as 15 or 10, and it can be as large as 300, depending on the event and depending on the, the facilitator. Uh, some of the developments I've seen over the years when we started back in, well, I used, I used, I used to do it even before that in, in maybe 19, ooh, 1994, 1998, different different areas in different, in, in different organizations and in, in agencies. But the one thing that has uh, come up again and again is this concept of intersectionality, right? So it's not just about race. It's not just about religion. There are elements of, of, of age uh, coming into it, there's elements of, of nationality. Uh, were you born in? Was I born in Singapore? Was I born and raised somewhere else? You know, did I come from? So these these come up as well, and and of course with uh, and things like, for example, even race or body image comes in as well. You know, when I engage in this dialogue, so the idea of beauty and the idea of self esteem been tied into how how dark skinned some people are and and how they might be when they're safe they talk about how they're referred to or they're bullied or they're they're being called names in school so they all starts to come in in these areas uh so that's one uh the intersectionality and, and gender comes in a, a big thing as well sexual orientation um etc and these are, are, are aspects that have come up in a lot of the conversations and and very recently not very recently but over the last couple of years mental health because identity uh, and how it connects to mental health uh, and, 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 and having that self-concept, self-esteem, that self-efficacy uh, and even struggling with that identity or how they're being perceived uh, comes up in the frank and, and vulnerable conversations. Um, I have had the privilege to work with facilitators who are 70 years old, 70 plus, and facilitators who are also 14 plus and 15 years old. So peer facilitation uh, in schools has, has come up really strongly in my work with, say, for example, some of my clients directly with schools or with uh, wonderful organizations like OnePeople.sg or the Community Development Councils. So, so the age thing, I can see all the bits in between. Uh, we have facilitators who've come all the way from Turkey, from France, from America. Uh, we have uh, students who've, uh, who have facilitated um, who have actually become facilitators and they, they, they meet students from the special assisted plan schools or madrasas, uh, the technical ITEs, right? And so, they, they, and, and neighborhood schools. And so I think this is a really healthy uh, beginning. Or we, we should expand it if we can, where they get a glimpse into different worlds uh, that, that I believe exist in Singapore. And sometimes we don't see these other worlds. And I, I, I for one, believe that 
there are many different worlds. I, I find it hard, I struggle to think of one Singapore that way. It's a very provocative statement, but there are many worlds. And sometimes because of where we are born and who we are, we, we have a limited sort of uh, experience or exposure to these different worlds. And so it, these opportunities allow us to, to sort of like uh, get to know uh, the others who we may not have had opportunities to mix around and listen to their perspectives and their experiences. So this is really what I do. Uh, the other thing that has come up, um, uh, uh, folks who have, uh, have self-identified as being homeless, uh, and that's come into conversations as well. Uh, and, and, and that's a good thing, you know, or, and they can be homeless for different reasons, right? Whether they are East Coast or Changi, or whether they are moving from, from family, different family, extended family homes in different houses. Um, and on the other side as well, we have uh, the pressures of, of being in uh, certain streams or certain uh, programs or certain schools that, that, that have that kind of um, intense pressure that they struggle with. Uh, maybe the, the, the more elite schools, for one of a better word, I, I should find a different word, I guess, or the special assisted plan schools. So we have that, that understanding. We all think that, or, or rather most of the people who are in the circle feel that well, they've got it worse or they've got it, other people got it better. And then they write, wow, it's really, really uh, interesting to put these stories side by side and see a person. And then uh, also these sharing comes with emotional release. And so they might see tears. They might see uh, anger. Uh, and that's, I think, the, the, the strength and also the potential thing, thing that needs to be managed because it is not this sanitized conversation where it stays in the head. Uh, really, it's about engaging cognitively and affectively and they see, wow, you know, um, somebody going through body image issues really or somebody being called this uh, does get upset. Uh, they do cry, you know, or being called, you know, you're not like, you're kantang, you know, you're not, you're not really Chinese, you know, you're uh, kantang, words like that, labels like that, and how different people take it on. Uh, and and if, the, if the conditions are right, if you're able to hold that safe space, they get to experience that, that, that energy as well. And I think that's part of the education and the experience. I think I've spoken long enough, sorry. No, it's all right. I mean, uh, interestingly, the first time I met Farid was actually um, while he was doing facilitation. I didn't know who he was and I entered a room and, and people were literally crying, right? Talking about the kind of experiences they face or uh, with regard to race and uh, racism. So thank you very much for that, Farid. Mm -hmm. um, so from experiential learning on a person-to-person -person level, I'd now be interested to hear uh, about how so-called macro changes uh, can happen. For, for that, we turn to Prof Chong. Um, Prof, many people think that academics are sitting in their ivory towers, uh, writing papers to basically themselves. Maybe that's true, but for you, I feel it's a lot different. In fact, uh, a lot of your work has uh, gone on to sort of design policies uh, to especially help children and mothers. Um, and, and recently with your new uh, child center, congratulations on that. Um, so yeah, so perhaps you can talk to us about how um, how you, you brought about changes or how changes has happened in your field of work and how you have contributed to that. Prof Chong, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Shamil, for the question. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, as I wear several hats, I, I think, you know, when I speak today, I'm mainly speaking from the point of uh, an academic uh, who, you know, has had the privilege to lead the uh, growing up in Singapore towards healthy outcomes or gusto study. So, um, my experience with change making has basically been, especially in the last 10 years, where a lot of the findings coming out from our gusto study has actually um, been influential in some of uh, the practices uh, and maybe some of the policies that government is uh, uh, considering. So I find that when you know trying to make change, the uh, it's like what Farid said. You you've um, got to tell stories, right? So the first thing is you've got to seize opportunities to engage policymakers when they arise. You you can't sort of come wait for them to invite you all the time. Then then you communicate, you know, give your your stories, and then you have to convince them, right? So um, <clears throat> convincing. Uh, policy makers, it's not about like shouting loud, see who shouts the loudest, uh, you know, or, or makes the most noise. You, you've got to convince them with, uh, from, from my point of view, as academic data, evidence, and reason. So, um, as you said, uh, we've managed to do that in the um, early childhood space because our study is around mothers uh, and the children that they give birth to that we've been following up for the last 10 years. So, you know, as an academic, I can't do anything without PowerPoint slides. So, I'm going to ask for I'm going to show you some slides now, right? So, um, you know, if you could show my slide. Okay, so uh, I assume that I'm seeing the, the the audience can see my slide, right? So basically a lot of the work yes. we do uh, is uh, in a, around human potential. 
And how do we define human potential? It's basically the uh, you know, set of intrinsic and acquired health and abilities of individuals uh, as they progress throughout their life. So, um, and next. Um, so basically our aim uh, in a study is to find ways to give uh, people the best start to life and to help them develop optimally. So that basically every, every individual right at the center of the, 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 peak, the mountain peak in the center, uh, we, we help them optimize their individual potential. At the same time, for the individuals who come from less fortunate backgrounds, we like to level them up uh, as well to, you know, again, help them with, uh, get to the highest uh, level of achievement they can. And then overall, this will lead to the whole population benefiting and improving the human capacity of Singapore, right? Because really, Singapore only has one natural resource, and that's the people, uh, and we have to make the most of it. Uh, next. And a lot of what we do in the early childhood space is because it's all about early intervention. Uh, if you intervene early in life, if you set a child on the right paths and right habits, uh, then, then you know, it's easier for them to maintain a healthy trajectory and avoid the, the negative uh, trajectories. Okay, so uh, next slide. So this is the Gusto study. It's a study where we're following up 1,200 uh, families from the time the mothers were in the first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, and we've been following them up ever since then. And the children are both turned 12 years old in November this year the oldest child, right? So basically uh, a decade of work. And this, this study has followed up many, many elements of uh, the lives of these families. Um, and, you know, next, uh, basically, uh, you, you can see it's been highly acclaimed both by, you know, our local policymakers as well as international uh, scientific uh, people. Okay, next. So the two, key, there are two key findings I can use as examples of how our evidence has uh, influenced thinking in Singapore. So the first key finding one is around uh, women getting gestational diabetes in pregnancy. And the key finding two is around how the, the mother's uh, mental state during pregnancy, how that actually affects the child's potential uh, as they grow up. Next. So the uh, first one is gestational diabetes. So right at the bottom uh, left uh, corner, you see that there's a uh, back in 2014, the Ministry of Health published a guideline around the management of diabetes. Uh, and at that time, like the rest of the world, they were recommending that mothers were only screened for gestational diabetes if they had high risk factors. But we found uh, in the same year, we published a paper that showed that in Singapore, if you did that, you will miss half the women with gestational diabetes. Because in, in Singapore, the women uh, can get gestational diabetes, although they don't uh, fall into the high risk category. So that's the first thing, we are missing half the women. Uh, next, and uh, so uh, it, I, was, I was quite fortunate. One day I was, uh, I went to a meeting late and I, and then, you know, the only seat left was next to the permanent secretary of health uh, at that time, Mrs. Tan Chingyi. So I sat down next to her and then during the a coffee break, we spoke and I told her about our findings about gestational diabetes. And she said, oh, wow, I better come and pre present to the Ministry of Health. So in September 2015, I presented this sort of uh, our own white paper to them, telling them that you know, we were routinely missing half the, the women of gestational diabetes in Singapore. Uh, next. And to the credit of the Ministry of Health, uh, in 2018, they, they changed the policy. So in, in Singapore, because of our findings, uh, they, they, they no longer did a high-risk approach. They tested everybody. Uh, they are recommending that everybody, every woman who gets pregnant in Singapore gets tested for gestational diabetes. So all credit, within a four-year time frame, less than four-year time frame, our research publication had turned into a government policy. Okay. So this may not seem very impressive, but normally it's, the time it takes from a scientific finding to turn into a policy is 17 years. Um, you know, so this is less than four years. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. Okay, uh, next. And so, uh, the question is that, okay, so what's the big deal about gestational diabetes? It's actually, as an obstetrician myself, deliver babies and still deliver babies, gestational diabetes is not that serious a disease for most women. Uh, they don't, uh, it doesn't really cause a lot of problems most of the time, and it's quite easy to manage. But one thing we did find is that, uh, and this study we just published early this year, in 2021, was that women with gestational diabetes have 12 times the risk of becoming diabetics themselves eventually. So what we found from this study was that uh, actually 44% of women who had 
gestational diabetes diagnosed in our Gusto study, went on to become either pre-diabetic or diabetic in, within five years of that uh, first diagnosis. So the important point here is that the gestational diabetes it's, diagnosis itself is not important as a, uh, that important by itself, but the fact is that it's an indicator that this woman has a very high risk of becoming diabetic herself. And so we shouldn't miss the opportunity of doing interventions to actually change their fate. Uh, and it's not just the women, but also the children who are affected next. So basically, uh, right now, uh, we are working with the, uh, the Child and Maternal Health and Wellbeing Task Force to uh, take note of this finding, to, use, to make gestational diabetes a diagnosis that is flagged up forever in a woman's health records so that uh, uh, other health uh, care, uh, givers can uh, monitor their risk of becoming diabetic and also to have people remind these women to modify their lifestyle so that uh, they uh, will prevent themselves from becoming diabetic and also to monitor the children's uh, progress. Okay, so that's one, one example of a fast reaction by the Singapore government of, uh, uh, in, in changing policy. Next is around uh, the mother's mental health during pregnancy. So um, like everywhere else in the world, about 10% of uh, women in pregnancy before, during and after have uh, what we call clinical depression. But what is not known is another 30% have high, very high levels of depressive symptoms. So basically 40% of women who are pregnant in our study, which uh, you know, more or less reflects the Singaporean uh, population, um, have very high levels of depressive symptoms. So that's uh, not nice, of course, right? And, uh, and the reason why they are, they are depressed could be because of the pregnancy, uh, physiological changes. It could be because of the stresses of uh, carrying a pregnancy uh, while you know, working, where most women in Singapore are working. Uh, and you know, then the, some of the leave policies for uh, pregnant women are you know, not so friendly for some places. So, um, and then thirdly, of course, is the amount of support they get from their family, right? So, okay, so women are, uh, stress during pregnancy. Uh, what is the main problem with this? Okay, next. The problem with this is that uh, our studies and we, you know, Gusto, we did an MRI of the child when within one week of the time they were born. What we showed was that on MRI, uh, we found that one part of the child's brain, which is associated with mood anxiety disorders, was altered uh, in children whose mothers were, had high levels of depressive symptoms. Okay, and this was found at one week of life. And when we repeated the study at four years of life, it was still present. Next. Okay, but those are MRI changes. What is the effect on the child's function, brain function? Well, if you look at this graph, on the right side, you see the green bars. These are uh, bars showing the, um, pre, uh, the school readiness skills of children born to mothers who had very, very low levels of stress. But on the left side of the, of the graph, you see the light gray and light blue bars. And light gray bars uh, depict the children of mothers who had uh, high levels of depressive symptoms uh, but subclinical. And the light blue bars are those with uh, very high levels of depression and maybe what you call clinical depression. But basically what it means is that whether the mother is either clinically depressed or subclinically depressed, the children four years after birth perform less well on uh, this test, which tests the child's readiness uh, for school. And this was done at four years of life. Okay, so basically the, the mother's depression during the, the nine months of pregnancy had an effect which lasted to you know, four years of life. And we also have shown that this school readiness test predicts very well which children require learning support when they enter primary one uh, in Singapore. So there's a long lasting impact. So next. So, um, so basically, uh, you know, we, we, we published that first study on MRI in 2013. Uh, and that's the time when we realized that actually, well, 40% of mothers are affected. Next. Um, so as I mentioned, I met uh, uh, the Permanent Secretary of Health who asked me to present these findings. So when I told her about the GDM, the gestational diabetes finding, she says, present that to the Ministry of Health. When I told her about the mental health study, she says, oh, this one, you can present the Ministry of Health, but probably you need to present to a multi-ministry uh, agency. So, uh, and okay, so that's, that's what she said. Next. So basically, um, right now we know that uh, the mothers, a lot of mothers get uh, depressed during pregnancy and it affects the child's function, right? Uh, and then next, and 
Last Friday, we launched the Child Centre, which I'll tell you more about shortly, which basically aims to help uh, to pick up children who might have difficulties. And we're not talking about children with a, a real disease, but basically children who can benefit from further and you know, uh, learning before they start school so that they can be happier and cope better when they enter primary one. Right. So next. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we, uh, next, uh, we, we presented these findings to, um, to, to Ministry of Health. And unlike the, the gestational diabetes studies, no policy has been changed yet. Right? Uh, Ministry of Health responded quickly and changed the policy within four years. But for this study on the maternal mental health, no obvious policy change has happened yet. And the reason is this. Next. So we were asking for three, three things. Just routinely screen all women who uh, come and see a doctor for, uh, for pregnancy for the depressive symptoms. If they are deep, have high levels of depression, refer them to uh, professional help. And three, maybe target the high-risk group. So people coming from uh, you know, lower socioeconomic status families, because these are going to be the ones who are usually most stressed. Okay, next. So the, the reason uh, Perm said to us that this needs to be presented to a multi-ministry uh, agency is because while Ministry of Health can you know, take care of some of these recommendations like screening uh, for depressive symptoms and offering them help, they can't do other things like this. So next. So like improving the, the work arrangements uh, that employers give them uh, pregnant women uh, and also you know, offering families uh, more resources or enhancing the maternity leave uh, uh, benefits. So this is something that requires a multi-ministry effort. And I'm happy to say that next, this year in March, uh, the government announced the formation of a mount interagency or multi-ministry uh, task force on child and maternal health and well-being. And I'm, I'm involved in this task force now. And basically we are making all these recommendations and I'm quite sure that uh, you'll hear about some policies around this uh, by early next year when the, this task force uh, will roll out a five-year strategy uh, for this purpose. So next. So, and, and what is the role of uh, non-governmental agencies? I mean, it's not only a government who can, uh, who are responsible for change. So in this case, the Lian Foundation, uh, you know, a philanthropic organization gave uh, the, you know, the Young Lulin School of Medicine a very generous endowment uh, last year. And that enabled us to launch the Center for Holistic Initiatives for Learning and Development, uh, which is featured here. And this, uh, this center basically will do research and disseminate the best evidence to all the people on the ground who are in this early childhood and family services space uh, to help them lift the game and then help Singaporeans all to have the best start to life. Um, and that's it, I think. Thank you. You can uh, stop sharing my slides. So this is just an example of how, um, you know, as, as an academic, I've managed to, uh, you know, our team have managed to influence government practice and policy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Chum. In fact, you know, uh, while preparing for uh, this uh, panel, um, after reading some of your research, you know, because my, my own wife is uh, pregnant as well. So I went back, like, are you, are you stressed out or not? You know, I became a bit more paranoid because I think an uh, uh, important message here is also that, you know, it's a all hands on deck kind of approach. You know, it's not just on the mother, but also, as you mentioned, all of us play a part in kind of creating that kind of stress free environment for our, our uh, mothers. Yeah. Um, now, from, from talking about um, early childhood uh, development and well-being, um, let's fast forward a bit and talk about ageing, and that's where our next uh, speaker, Susanna, uh, will, will sort of uh, bring us through the kind of changes in her domain and also um, how she has uh, designed and piloted programs in her Wampo um, uh, community. Susanna, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Shamil. Uh, thank you, IPS team, uh, for this kind invitation to be part of this forum. Uh, as you have mentioned, I have been working uh, in Singapore since 2002 through South Foundation, and I've been working with older people and on aging and gender issues. So actually, what Prof Chong was saying is uh, very interesting to, to us because uh, uh, the long-lasting effect, especially on women, is something that uh, we need to take into consideration once they become older. Um, I, let me just introduce a little bit the South Foundation in the context of our uh, sharing this afternoon. So South Foundation is a Singapore-based but regionally oriented uh, not-for-profit foundation, and we advance the positive transformation of the aging experience 
We seek mindset and systemic change by implementing innovation in community-based elder care, training and education, policy-relevant research, collaboration, and advocacy. I'm here today to share experience in changing the mindset of our older population about themselves, how we are transforming their experience in growing older in the community, and how we are advancing and advocating for systemic change with the support of key stakeholders through the piloting of our Community for Successful Aging, or COMSA program model, which uh, the concept was actually developed first in 2009, and subsequently we managed to pilot test it in the Wampo community. So I will let me uh, answer your question about the significant changes by saying there's actually three, and uh, it's a bit of a historical but interesting uh, changes in 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 how uh, in Singapore for the last ten years. The first one is about uh, what uh, uh, Prof said about seizing the opportunity. I call it grabbing the opportunity. In 2011, uh, the City for All Ages initiative of the government aimed at making different communities in Singapore age-friendly uh, was actually uh, started. Two years after that, in 2013, Sao, as a member of the CFAA committee, which was uh, then shared by SMOS uh, Dr. Amy Kaur, had the opportunity to collaborate with the CFAA on this initiative in Wampo. We accepted the invitation as we actually developed this uh, in 2009, as I've said, the program model called Community for Successful Aging or COMSA, a whole community and population approach to healthy aging, which focuses on taking a preventive life course and systems perspective to address the biopsychosocial health and well-being of older residents through the building of a seamless and integrated health and social care system the promotion of intergenerational community bonding and solidarity, and the multi-pronged engagement of all stakeholders. This opportunity and the endorsement of the advisor, uh, Mr. Heng Chi Hao, got us into the entrance of the Wampo community in 2013. But our purposeful and dedicated engagement with key grassroots leaders like the CCC, the CFAA co-chairs in Wampo, and the different uh, chairpersons of the resident committees and the staff of the Wampo CC, as well as the other social service agencies within Wampo, embedded us in the community. The second is about shifting mindset from looking at aging as a burden versus longevity as opportunity. This significant change happened, uh, started to happen in 2013. In November 2013, South Foundation had uh, celebrating, uh, celebrated its 20th anniversary. So we invited to Singapore Professor Ursula Staudinger, who was then the president of the International Longevity Center USA, and she was the director then of the Robert N. Butler Columbia Aging Center at the Columbia University. So she was the distinguished speaker for that uh, Madame Sao Ung Yushan public lecture. In this lecture, Professor Ursula talked about the future of aging and how we can shift the trajectory of aging by what we do now in keeping our populations healthy through the life course. She also emphasized that old age and productivity can indeed go very well together. And her presentation is very much based on evidence. The guest of honor at that public lecture was then Minister Gan Kim Yong. And through their conversation that evening, South Chairman, perceived that his perception of aging started to shift. So there was a bit of a shift as a result of that. So in March 2015, Ms. Minister for Health Gan Kim Yong launched the Action Plan for Successful Aging, which is now the blueprint to enable Singaporeans to grow older with confidence and primarily redefine how aging is now viewed. It is not anymore a burden, but an opportunity. When we went to Wampo in 2013, actually one of our key purpose was to redefine how the community view aging from one of burden to one of opportunity. We wanted to promote a more positive view of age, older persons and of aging in the community. We wanted Wampo residents to know that COMSA as a program is about celebrating together the fact that Singaporeans are gonna be living longer and growing older in the community, but they can continue to thrive even for those who have mobility and functional limitations. And our approach to this mindset shift was true community development approach. And then we had three key goals in this. One, we build the knowledge, skills, and attitudes of every older person about aging so they can be confident in taking care of themselves. 
The second is we build peer support and social capital among them so that they can see themselves as having a more positive attitude about themselves. And the third was to empower them, empower them to contribute actively to the community, thus shifting how the rest of the community perceive older people and aging. With grants from the Tote Boards Community Healthcare Fund, we piloted various initiatives in Wampo, and which as a grant recipient gave us opportunities to strategically engage with the key officers and staff of the Aging Planning Office, AIC, and other key stakeholders, and further advocate for this mindset change. That's the second significant change. The third happened in 2018 when the Ministry of Health announced that they will be transforming our healthcare system by making three shifts. One, beyond hospital to community. The second is beyond healthcare to health. And the third is beyond quality to value, aimed at bringing healthcare closer to home and to support Singaporeans to age well in the community, make healthy lifestyle, lifestyle choices and get good healthcare at the best affordable value. The last one, we would like to believe that with the Comsa Center in, in 2016, which is, has been now up and running, we help to catalyze change through demonstrating what can be done to keep our seniors healthy through population health, community service integration, close coordination between the hospitals and the community, as well as prevention of people from stepping up into avoidable hospital care and premature nursing home placement. So these are the significant changes in the historical background and how South Foundation has played a role in, in, in kind of like pushing through the piloting of uh, the, our program model in Wampo uh, called Comsa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Susanna. And um, it, it's important that we, you know, we don't forget the different, different people in our communities. And with that, I would like to uh, sort of turn to, to John, actually. Uh, John, I think, I mean, COVID has showed how we are inextricably uh, connected um, and perhaps some people in our community are more uh, visible or more invisible than, than others. You know, the idea of uh, out of sight, out of mind um, comes to mind. And, and with your work with TWC2, how, could you sort of uh, comment on the changes you've seen uh, thus far and, you know, how TWC2 has contributed to that? Thank you, John. Yes, uh, thank you. Um... Well, the COVID in some ways has accelerated changes, but but generally we accept that change is going to take a long time. And I was interested to hear Yap Seng talk about 17 years for the research to get into policy, because I, I started work with TWC2 practically when it was founded. And uh, I worked on a background paper then on, on domestic workers and, and what sort of resources were available to help them if they had any problems. And I was rather surprised to find that there actually were quite a few resources, but the main problem was not whether they existed or not, but whether domestic workers could actually reach them, whether they could use them. And the main problem there was with workers who didn't have any time off and who had no means of communicating with the outside world. So you can, you can give counsellors, you can have advisors, you can have hotlines, but if people can't access them, they're not going to do much use. So... Um, that was an issue which I started to work on. And of course, um, you know, I also believe that that pe everyone was entitled to uh, to rest time as well. So it was it wasn't simply a matter of of countering abuse, but it was one of the factors. Um, so we, we, we worked on proposals. We worked to see how how many workers were getting were, were, were affected by not having time off and how much time off those who uh, did have it uh, were, were given. And I, I think. I think we'd rehearsed all the arguments pretty pretty well within the first three years or so. And so it just went on from then. And it became more difficult, actually, over time to come up with new ways of, of raising the, the arguments and raising um, ideas uh, because, because they were all out there. The, the, the case was very clear. Um, but change has taken place gradually. And um, it's, not, it's still not where we would like it to be. But back in, in uh, 2013, I think it was, um, the, the Ministry of Manpower uh, introduced this policy on a mandatory day off, which actually, although it didn't make a, a, a day off uh, available for all domestic workers, it said it was a right. And if you gave it up, it should be compensated. So that was a step forward. Um, and now, um, just, just a very short time ago, um, there was the announcement that within a couple of years, uh, one day off a month must be given and taken and couldn't be negotiated away. 
So it's taken quite a while to get to this stage. I still want there to be a day off every week for domestic workers. I think that's that's very important. It's 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 what most of us would expect for ourselves anyway. Um, and we, if we decide to do it, uh, it can be done. It's, it's just having the willpower, I think, to to solve the problems that might be involved. But it, it's something that should happen. So that's that's that to me is one thing where I've seen progress, but it's it's taken uh, it's taken such a long time. I started work on it in two thousand and two. Um, other things, um, yes, have, 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 we've worked on many other issues. Uh, we work through um, advocacy, research, uh, public engagement and direct services, and, and they interlink very well. Um, we, could, we could just concentrate on the direct services, but we really want to work ourselves out of existence. We want to solve the problems and, and walk away and get on with the rest of our lives. Um, and so the direct services, we do those, we provide them, but we, we learn from them. And that's very important in informing our advocacy and research. So we're not just talking about ideas which we've come up with uh, in abstract. They are very, very uh, practical problems that we're dealing with. And we're also coming up with what we think are some practical solutions. Um, Another area, I think, I think anybody who uh, remembers traveling around the highways of Singapore 10 years plus back will remember migrant, male migrant workers traveling on the back of lorries and, and they were open backed and the sun would be beating down on their heads part of the time. And if, it, if there was a deluge, they got soaked to the skin within seconds. We would like them to be transported in enclosed vehicles, uh, mini, minivans, buses and so on. But one of the changes that did take place was there was there were, there were additional safety precautions introduced um, and uh, there were covers were mandated for vehicles. So that was a step forward. Again, it's not exactly what we wanted. It didn't go as far, but it was progress. Another thing uh, that's taken place, um, a third example, was around about 10 years or so, we put forward the argument that if we wanted to deal with um, resolving pay issues, we needed to document things better. Documentation could play an important part. And it was surprising how little documentation there actually was when it came to try to resolve a pay dispute. So we said, let's, uh, how about informing workers in writing of what pay they should receive before they, they, they start a job? That was introduced. So every worker should get a copy of their in principle approval. Step forward. Um, when they come to Singapore, how about making sure that they actually get the, the get what they they've they've earned over the previous month? So what about um, uh, pay slips for all workers? Itemized pay slips. This is the rate you should be paid at. These are the hours that you worked. It's very basic, but all low paid workers could benefit from that, and that that did become policy as well. The holdout was on the, the last link in the process, if you like, um, which was to um, get workers salaries paid into bank accounts. And this seemed like a complicated process. So, so the government actually um, th said that it was a good idea, essentially, and um, quite a number. And, and there, was, there was some push to get that done, but it was not law that you had to, to help your workers um, set up bank accounts and all workers had to have them. Um, it was more advice and uh, a desire that it should happen. COVID-19, of course, with um, the desire that people should not be uh, uh, um, being in be, be in contact with each other, close contact, physical contact, meant that this was something that was hurried along. And suddenly something which looked like it might take a few more years to accomplish was introduced. So, so the three steps that cover documentation of um, salaries um, and, and due salaries uh, are now are now in place. Um, now there's still difficulties in, in practice with um, with follow up with enforcement and so on. But in these three areas, I can say there were there was progress achieved, and I think there's been a progress achieved in other areas. We still exist because uh, the problems haven't been solved, but there's th 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 there've been moves towards dealing with the problems. So this is something which is uh, is, is quite pleasing. Um, and uh, I think one other thing which is less quantifiable is changes in public moods and attitudes. And this is something that you want to bring about because it really underpins everything else. Um, legislative changes can, can be made ineffectual if they don't have any credibility with the public. So um, 
I think that uh, Singaporeans today, particularly younger Singaporeans, are more sensitive to migrant workers' conditions. Uh, you'll find that they tend to be more ready to speak up when they see something which they feel is unjust and unfair. And I think in its own modest way, TWC2 has played a part in, in, in changing attitudes we, through our public outreach, through involving volunteers in our work, um, through through um, help help with the, with with media articles and a lot of a lot of sorts any channels that we can we can use. Um, so I'm I'm pleased that uh, that the, with the progress we've made, even though I think it's been quite slow, but I look forward to to seeing these uh, these objectives um, all won over time. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, John. And you know, I'm looking at the the number of uh, questions coming in from our audience who've been uh, patiently waiting. So I'll cut down my questions. So I had like I had a whole list of uh, questions to ask you guys. So I just have one more question to ask you guys before I pass it over to um, our audience. Uh, um, so the question is, you know, looking at trends, right? And this this relates to our reimagining Singapore 2030 uh, project itself. Right? What are some key trends you think? Uh, uh, in your area of work, and also um, what you hope uh, Singapore will be like in 2030. And connected to that, I know it's like a major, major, major question. How will we get there? Right? And if you can briefly uh, touch on that topic, that'd be great. I'll start with you, Fariam. Okay, hi, thank you, Shamil. Um... Well, some of the trends I've already alluded to earlier on, uh, and that's the intersectionality. Socioeconomic class is a big one, and recently it's come up. Uh, and so these conversations need to take place. Uh, these relationships need to be nurtured, right? Uh, and uh, so, for example, um, the thing about uh, migrant workers, we've had, uh, we've had facilitators being trained who are migrant workers, you know? So we had a Bangladeshi gentleman, Zakir Hussein, who's, uh, who's a very active facilitator with us, and we hope to have more. Uh, credit goes to one people that SG for actually you know opening that opportunity as well, um, but really uh, I, I see this this these, these um, the other thing that I, I think we need to consider more is the idea of going beyond the four what I call the five Fs. So we tend to have this this thing in schools that or maybe not just schools but everywhere where we tend to look at diversity through the if, when it comes to race through the lens of uh, you know festival food, fashion, you know, we wear each other's traditional clothes and then, you know, um, even, uh, and then we wave the flags and then, uh, and then we have this, this thing called faces. Well, why do I call it faces? Because every time we, we cartoonize or we caricaturize these, these reflections of the different races in Singapore, we tend to make uh, the Chinese, uh, the, the, Malay, the Malay character slightly darker than the Chinese ones and the Indian ones slightly darker than the Malay ones and the Indian girl always has long hair and the Indian girl has, you know, a, a red dot on her forehead and so that seems to like, you know, it gets stuck, you know, so much so that when you see an Indian person and then, oh, he's Indian Muslim or he's Indian Christian or Catholic or something like that, it's like, oh, wow, you know. So I think we need to go beyond caricatures, right? That's one of the things that I, I think we need to look at. The other thing I, I, I see happening as well is uh, so, for example, one of the times when a really powerful time that, uh, that, that, that hit me was when I was in a primary school. I won't mention the name of the school, but, you know, we had this, this tendency to want to show those 1964 videos, uh, the one of the racial riots, you know, uh, to the students. And so when I facilitated the session and I just opened it, right? So I asked these kids, they were primary five, to say, so what, what, what is it that you've learned from watching these videos? I mean, this, this riots. And so they were very open. They put up their hand and they say, uh, cheer, cheer, you know, uh, we must make friends with our, our Chinese uh, friends because otherwise they will kill us. You know, and, and, uh, and that's exactly what they said to me. And, and when I asked different segments and I say, okay, please write down, you know, what, 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 uh, what does the video show you? And he says, yeah, I think, you know, we must be very sensitive to the Malay people, otherwise they will kill us. You know, so I think we need to think deeply, you know, the kind of drivers we're trying to push, you know, and if we don't facilitate it well enough, these negative role modeling that we show uh, in different circumstances, and it's not just in schools, you know, that we start off on that, that footing, you know, I know it's meant well, you know, but it really needs to be facilitated well, and it needs to draw out these, this, this fear 
uh, as a basis to actually commence or rather to start relationships is not exactly a very healthy one. We need to have a, a whole host of, of possibilities, right? It's fun having friends who are differently. It's, it, it's the curiosity, the, 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 the excitement, the adventure. Of, of, of. So those are things that, that I think um, that I, I think we need to consider, right? Um, um, one of the, the other thing I just like to say right now is uh, I, I think we can do a lot more with uh, diversity uh, and, and I, I choose to, I, I think we need to see beyond just race. I think Singapore, because of our history, we tend to look everything through the lens of race a lot, you know, when really it, it has a whole lot of uh, other combinations, there's gender, there's you know nationality, there's mental health, there's special needs, there's you know just just so many other things. And so if you choose to see it through the lens of just one category, then you you tend to come up with one conclusion. Uh, and so that's another mindset that I think we need to move uh, and shift. And finally, I think we can do a lot more at the workplace. Uh, you know, so for example, I do some work in Australia, and uh, they have how many week? It's not just one day. Now we have racial how many day in schools, right? What about bringing it to the to the workplace? Uh, and, and having things going on there. And I really, when I say this, I really mean that we need to go also just beyond the five Fs if we can do it, you know, to really understand the person, not just the person, the, the, the race or the, 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 the caricature of the race or the understanding of the race, but even within that, that particular so-called ethnic background, there's so much diversity. Uh, and to be able to sort of understand that rather than put people in pigeonholes, uh, and I think those are some, some really important possibilities. And I would end by saying that the most important thing is to have deep, authentic relationships. It's about relationships and it's about nurturing relationships, both at the one-to-one -one level, the community level, whether it's Wampo or the school. And if you have friends, if I have friends who are, you know, uh, of a particular ethnic group or mental health condition, if I read a particular uh, meme or a particular uh, post on social media that says, oh, people who have mental health are like this, I say, no, I've got a friend who's got depression. He's not like that. So, you know, because I know someone. But if I didn't, like maybe I don't know somebody from Africa or I don't know somebody from, I don't know, Venezuela, and I, 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 see, I see somebody asking a question about Africans, all I have to rely on is something I read from somewhere that's stored in my folder in my brain and that really is a kind of a stereotype or rather that's where I start from unless I have a, a relationship to actually counter that. So I guess I'll just stop there and uh, maybe we can uh, explore further later on. Right. Thank you for it and, and you know the idea of moving beyond the, the five Fs as you, as you, as you put it. Um, um, how, how about you Prof Chong in terms of uh, what do you hope to see in uh, 2030 and how do we get there? Uh, thanks, uh, Shamil. So I'll keep my uh, answers brief this time. No, no, no PowerPoint slides this time around. <laughs> uh, just three points. I think that the three trends that I think that's going to uh, change things um, over the next decade will be, uh, number one, I think um, the fast aging population, not only in Singapore, but in other parts of Asia and other parts of the world. So like in Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, even China. Um, and in Singapore, it's not, fast aging is not about uh, you know, people are aging faster, right? It's just that we are not replacing ourselves. So our total fertility rate has, you know, uh, halved since the time I graduated from medical school, it was almost two. And now this last year it was 1.1. So basically, uh, you know, that is causing our, our demographics to shift so that we're going to have a lot more older people. So, um, you know, currently we have about five people, uh, working people supporting one <clears throat> elderly above age of 65. In 2030, just 10 years time, it will be only two working people uh, supporting one person over uh, 65. So that's a scary uh, number to, to, to think about. Um, and uh, so that's number one, the fast aging population, that's gonna change a lot of things. Uh, you know, and Susanna has already mentioned that early on. Number two is that um, I, I think it's, it's, it, it's, it's a very important change that's upcome, overcome Singapore in the last two years, and which I hope will you know, influence the next 10 years. And that's that this year, you know, it has been declared the year of celebrating SG or Singaporean women. Um, so right now, this is a year where we'll be reflecting on recognizing and then revising uh, our views on the roles of women uh, in society um, and, and in, in our lives. And I think this is going to make a lot of difference in, you know, the, what I was talking about earlier about um, making, uh, you know, uh, the, the Singapore a much better place for families. In fact, that's the, the new 
tagline for Singapore government that uh, Singapore is made for families, right? So the idea is to create uh, situations where, because in, in Singapore, uh, women are expected to, you know, to be in a workplace, uh, to work uh, alongside the men. And uh, the only trouble is that uh, for people in my generation, for example, a lot of them are also expected to work when they go home, you know, uh, and the, but the men take time off. So this has got to change. And I'm happy to say that certainly when I look at my younger colleagues uh, in the school, and uh, the, it, it is already changing. But I think this conversation about celebrating SG women will accelerate the, this, this change. And the third big trend, I think, is the post-COVID world, right? Um, as John mentioned, COVID has, you know, accelerated a lot of change. So the idea of uh, doing things remotely was uh, interesting in the past, but now it's essential, right? So, you know, uh, one of the great changes for me uh, was, you know, now I can get hawker food delivered to my home uh, quite easily when in the past it was almost, you know, was a pipe dream, right? But now that's, that's really changed. And then the idea of now working from home. So I, I think uh, COVID has shown us what is possible. Uh, and I think it's, it's the impetus is on us to make sure that we examine this idea fully and, and, you know, and, you know, not go back to where we were before COVID, uh, but to, you know, take the expensive lesson that COVID has taught us to really move on, uh, drop things that are not working and, and find things that will work better for everybody. So those are the three key trends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof Chang. Susanna, um, how about yourself? Like 2030, you know, you're doing, you're doing your, your piloting in Wampo. Um, what hope, uh, what, where, where do you see things uh, moving towards in uh, 2030? And also, how do we get there? Okay, uh, I'll share with uh, one key trend, three uh, hopes for the future, and then five uh, insights. So it's a one, three, five, easier to remember. The main key trend uh, really in 2030 is that uh, one out of four Singaporeans will be age 65 by then. And the number of older persons in Singapore will be will increase to 900,000. Every uh, age 65, we will have uh, 900,000. And that's a major uh, change uh, uh, trend, main key trend for us. But a lot of them are going to be living longer and will stay healthy longer, actually. So that is, uh, that is the main key trend. In terms of changes, three changes I hope to see by 2030. As the number of active and healthy older Singaporeans are increasing, I hope that older Singaporeans will have representation throughout society, from the grassroots community levels up to the parliament, to speak to aging issues as well as society issues at large. A big part of the increase in the older population will be the more educated and tech savvy group whose experience and wisdom can be harnessed for our society to be more age-friendly and inclusive. It may also be good for some of them to be invited to sit in scenario planning, program implementation, monitoring evaluation, uh, research uh, around schemes, are they working, and then policies. The second change I would like to see is for policies that are addressing the financial security of older Singaporeans to be gender responsive and age and disability inclusive. I think some of the issues that we still need to think about and review before we reach 2030 is, uh, are the policies on caregiving, long-term care, work and learning for older persons. The third change I would like to see is older persons led social investment and entrepreneurial activities that will support our sustainable economic growth aspirations. I believe some of our future elders can learn from the gig economy now and has the potential to, with enabling support from the government to transform it into a gig economy that is sustainable, socially responsible and impactful. To me, this is the future of aging. And I'm very excited and look forward to continuing to contribute and uh, play a supporting role in this, uh, in this future. In terms of insights, I said there's five, very short. Uh, one, having a clear sense of purpose, of what change we want to see in 2030, and what are we together committing as a society that we will work on. We need to also have a very good combination of both ground up as well as top down. 
and to grab the right opportunities, influencers and endorsers along the way. And that would help us. We need to do more piloting. Piloting, co-creation, innovation and impact driven. We need to be involving those that we want the change to be the recipients. They're not just recipients, they should be participants of the change themselves. We need visionary leadership and committed team. And the last bit, which has always been one of the strong uh, values that has uh, uh, made us uh, at South Foundation is to never give up until we get there. And that has always helped us when the, the, the going got tougher at some point that we will never give up and until we get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Susanna. How about you, John? 2030, what are your hopes? How do we get there? Oh, well, there's a whole range of changes I'd like to see, but uh, I think one basic thing is really for migrant workers to be able to speak up more for themselves. That's very important. Um, that needs to be the channels through which they can, they can, they can make their voices heard. Um, they need to be secure against victimization, uh, being being sent home at the at the w will of their employer with no reason given. Um, I think I'd like to see workers being able to stay on longer in Singapore. So Singapore would benefit by enhanced uh, skills and experience, and the workers would would gain by being able to see um, the better return on the investment they've made by coming to Singapore in the first place. So those are things I'd like to see changing. Um, I, and also uh, for it to be made easier for them to change jobs. If they're unhappy in the job they are, um, then, then, then why not make it easier for them to change? Uh, there's arguments around that, but I think they can all be resolved. There's going to be circumstances that affect how we work. Aging has been mentioned. Um, and the whole area of aged care has to be thought about very carefully. Um, I mean, some of us are in the situation now where we are retirees ourselves looking after other retirees from a previous generation. That wasn't envisaged when the law said children should look after their parents. Um, it's a, and there's more and more going to be in that situation. Some people take early retirement to look after their aged parents. Now, I think that's a big source of, of care workers is going to be still migrant workers in the future. And we need to think about that. At the moment, uh, we tend to think, well, domestic workers can give, be given a bit of training in elderly care and they'll manage. But it's not just a matter of training. I think this training has to be specialised. But we also have to see what people's aptitude is. Not everyone is good at handling this. I think anybody who is, has handled um, dealing with elderly relatives over a space of time realises that can, it, can be, it can be trying, it can be difficult. So if, we're, if we want strangers to take this on, you know, we have to think very carefully about what we're asking of them and, and how they can sustain themselves in, in, in this experience. Um, another factor, I think if we see um, Singapore's population being at a certain stable level, um, we will probably see a, a, a shrinkage of the, of the construction sector. We've got mega projects going on at the moment. So we, if, if this happens, I think we'll see um, a shift in um, the, the, the structure of the migrant labour workforce, probably fewer male workers, probably more female workers going into the care sectors. Um, and uh, this, this will affect policies as well. Um, women workers may have different expectations about how they're, they're housed, for example, than the male workers who live in many work in, li live in uh, big dormitories. Um, and there's, there's a question of the care workers access to the face of work. So, um, I, and, and then another difficulty I think we're going to face is that, is that the countries of the area, despite COVID-19, I think they're going to see a revival, they're going to see uh, economies that are expanding, and there will be fewer people wishing to be migrant workers abroad. Um, and so this is going to be a challenge. We're going to see Japan taking in more migrant workers. I believe that China will have a change of policy. China faces a shortage of workers in certain sectors. Within the next five years, I'm sure there's going to be a declaration that China is now going to employ migrant workers from abroad and it will take them on in big numbers. Singapore is going to be in a very competitive environment then. So, so when we're thinking about the rights of workers, how they're paid, how they're treated, there's a matter of self-interest here. How do we attract workers in this kind of competitive environment? So, so these are things that we have to take, um, give a lot of thought to in, in uh, 
thinking about what Singapore might be like in, in 3030 and 20, 2030 and uh, making it more the way that we would like it to, to, to be. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, everyone here. And, you know, to the, the audience who's patiently working, I, I'm looking at all your questions. There's a lot of questions, so I'll try to go through as many as uh, possible. Now, the first up comes from uh, Carol, Carol, I believe from IPS. Um, the speakers come from di a diverse background and work with different constituents. A question to all, but it's basically inspired by what you said, uh, Susanna, on, uh, on increasing empowerment. Uh, in your work, have you encountered challenges with promoting ownership of problem solving among your target constituents? Constituents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Susanna, would you like to begin, or John? Um, yeah. yeah, I think I, I think migrant so, workers are always wary about their status, um, and uh, there's also there's always the things that that loom large in the consciousness. I mean, they come here to earn money to send home to support their families, so that tends to be what what they focus on. So we, we saw housing as a problem uh, before COVID-19 and, and many workers would just sort of take being housed in poor conditions as a price to be paid for, for working in Singapore. There'd be a bit of a shrug of the shoulders, but it wouldn't be an issue that they would volunteer in most cases. Um, and then you find COVID-19, suddenly they are very aware that being in crowded conditions with people who maybe may have an infectious illness is not good for you. So there was something of a change of outlook there. Um, but yes, I, I think that there's, um, what, and while migrant workers are, feel that they just have to focus on, 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 on their earnings and sending money home, there's, there's a reluctance to get to engage with other questions. Um, and uh, I, 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 they, they, they have enough on their plates, I think is the attitude. Right. Susanna, you wanted to say something? Our our experience in Wampo uh, has shown us that we uh, really need to get to know them well and uh, provide a safe place uh, to be able uh, to create uh, platforms whereby they could actually discuss among themselves, among th their group of elders, because they're the best uh, uh, the best people to know what their issues, they're experiencing it every day. So they're the best decision makers in terms of what is best for them to age well in the community. So what our role is to provide that uh, platform for them to have that discussion. But it took us a while to, to be able to have, to, to give them the confidence that they can actually do it and they can own it. And right now we were building a group of uh, older persons in Wampo, uh, training them as community advocates. So really looking at the, not just for themselves and their friends, but looking out for the community as a whole on their own issues. And hopefully they can also transcend beyond uh, issues of older persons to embrace issues, uh, other issues in the community, uh, including the, uh, like say the issues of the younger people in the community. So that could be as a good start. But we're starting from where they are, and that is very important. Yeah, I'd like to say something, Shamal. Yes, yes, I'm going to go to you. Yeah. Yeah, your question about um, you know getting them to own and maybe yes, right, yeah. part of the, the 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 solution. One of the challenges I, I think, and maybe John can comment on this one, is the huge power differential that mm. exists. You know, uh, say for example, in different communities, you know, so if you're of a different socioeconomic class, and especially if you're a, a migrant on a visa that is very, you know, um, you can just be um, you know, uh, you can just lose it, uh, at, at, you know, snap of your fingers. Um, and so you don't want to be seen to like make trouble so, or create trouble. And so that power differential, different segments in Singapore, it, it affects different, uh, you know, different, different groups differently. Uh, and so uh, this is an area that, that, that probably needs um, a, a, a closer look and, and perhaps, uh, um, you know, something that from John's experience, we can actually extrapolate and actually build uh, into other areas where, where communities or segments of the population uh, don't have that perceived or even actual power vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis trying to own and be part of the solution. Thanks. Just want to put that in. Thank, thank you, Farid. And I mean, I'm just, oh, there's another question actually is related to what you just said, uh, Farid, uh, from Chris and Salman. Um, basically, we're talking about um, creating safe spaces, right? But how do we actually create those safe spaces? And I think this kind of relates to what everyone 
is also talking about like safe spaces. How do we, I mean, in Wampo, we have this, uh, I think you had this idea of uh, sharing their stories, right, from the, the, with the elderly. But but with you, you're talking about a more, almost like a difficult topic race. Uh, but everyone is talking about spa uh, safe spaces. But what is the safe space and how do we actually uh, get there? Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the one of the things that I found useful in the past is where you've had a, a, a gathering of, um, of, of, of workers and you you might have maybe not not a big one but maybe uh 10 15 uh, in a room and and you're the only outsider so that puts them that that gives the workers confidence they've got mutual support and you know you make it very clear that you know you're there to listen to them and you you you're a facilitator really you may ask some questions but it's surprising what comes up then um once one person overcomes their shyness and starts speaking then the rest starts speaking and you get these all these stories coming out and you've come to find out one particular thing and then you go away and find out that you found out about so much more um that's important and and then finding um finding places is not intimidating i mean what what's what is a good place to meet um i mean a safe place it's an academic environment can seem intimidating, but if you can meet at a cafe, for example, or at some kind of com local community center, or sometimes even in some, you know, somebody's home, um, it depends on the scale, of course, but you can put people at their ease, uh, uh, an environment where they feel comfortable and not intimidated. That's very important. And you just have to be a good listener. I mean, listening is just, is key. You know, if you spend a long time, a long time, um commenting on their comments and this then, then you you just alienate them don't do that L listen intervene when you need to move things along a bit but but spend a lot of time learning yeah thanks john um uh, just to add to that and maybe yeah. um the others might want to chip in um I, I believe that the the physical environment plays a big role. So for example, in the work that I do, I very seldom use a lecture style seating and the circle uh, arrangement is a lot more empowering because it's a lot more leveling. So that's just one. And of course, if you're doing inter-religious dialogue, then, then you might want not to have you know, uh, icons or, or things around because you know, certain uh, religions are, are a bit sensitive to those kind of things. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I believe that yes, listening is very important, totally, but also the authentic relationship that the facilitator has with the, with the clients or with the participants. You can't fake it, you know, they'll, they'll get it. You know, so the idea that long before the facilitation circle starts, you know, you're out there, you're making friends, you're, you're actually getting to know them and you're genuinely curious, you're genuinely interested uh, in actually finding out about their life. And, and this is the other bit, the idea, the fact that you're putting a bit of yourself in there as well. So, so it's not just uh, tell me, tell me, tell me, but here's a little bit about me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a bit of, uh, and that's important in that shared uh, thing. And, and the third thing that I find works is um, before we, we actually do the conversations, we talk about how we are going to talk, right? And so this is called the full value commitment. You know, so we're going to do this in the next 30 minutes. Let's spend 10 minutes. What kind of values, attitudes, and behaviors do you think we need to remind ourselves so that you know, uh, people feel safe? And so people talk about oh, respect, or my, they might say, uh, and then I might ask, what, what, John, you know, um, how would you like to be respected in the next hour? You know, so we try to unpack that and then courage. So we bring that up again. And what about um, um, what kind of conversations? Maybe they might say honesty or authentic or genuine. Then I says, well, what if genuine and authentic, authentic conversations um, cause a bit of ouch, cause a bit of hurt? Yeah. How do we negotiate this space between honesty and, 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 and the fact that it might, be, it might be hurtful to some people. And the point is, I'll ask the group, how, how should we do that? And I agree with you, John, they, they are able to come up with the solutions themselves. So they might say, oh, be sensitive, or they might say, well, don't take things personally. Let's try to phrase it this way. But the point is we are bringing it to the consciousness how they're going to have that conversation. And so there are a whole load of other stuff, but these are tr three critical areas, relationships, vulnerability, and, and creating that culture or that, that, that commitment to how we're going to have that, uh, those, those interactions. Uh, it may be an hour, it may be a day, it may be co consecutive sessions. But those are some uh, strategies that, that I found work for me, Shamil. Right, thank, thank you very much, uh, Farid. Now, turning to uh, Prof Chong. Prof Chong, we've got a number of questions, even uh, some more technical questions. But I'll begin with this, since we're talking uh, about um, the ouch. Perhaps some fathers are uh, feeling a bit left out. So, Sato and Shane, thank you for your question. Um, what part do fathers play in the development of children? Would paternal leave reduce stress of caretaking and careers on mothers? 
Uh, thanks, thanks, Shamil. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, you know, no, no intention to leave fathers out of the equation. But uh, so, no, no, the, the father has an incredibly important role, right? So first of all, in, in supporting uh, his wife uh, or partner to, you know, so, so that uh, uh, the pregnancy period is not so stressful. I mean, I think part of the stresses is when women feel they're not supported or they feel alone uh, in what they're doing. So I think uh, that's, uh, you know, and it's emotional, not just physical uh, or logistical support. So I think that's a very important role. Then I think where the where, when the child is out, I think, um, you know, the, the first week of life after the child is born, I mean, I'm an obstetrician, I deliver babies uh, regularly. And I can tell you when our patients see me in the first week of life, uh, uh, some of them are very stressed out because it's, they're tired from the delivery. Um, they're trying to breastfeed the, the baby and it's not something that is easy to get started or to do well uh, initially. Uh, and then you have all the visitors, in-laws uh, coming in and you know, making things uh, much more complex. So I think this is where the, 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 the father, the, the husband can basically step in, protect the wife, support them, uh, give them time off, let them sleep, um, you know, help with the, uh, the you know, the diaper changing uh, and, and, and everything. So I think there are lots of that to go on. And that's only at the start of life, right? Um, but bringing up a child is not only about maternity leave or paternity leave. The child is going to need your support and care for the first, I don't know, uh, in, uh, you know, 10, 20 years of their lives, right? I mean, even 20-year-old children are still... By 30. <laughs> uh, I, I think Singapore is nearer to 40, actually, but... <laughs> Basically, uh, the, these people need your, your advice, support, uh, um, you know, for a long time. So um, when we talk about maternity, paternity leave, that's usually restricted to the first two, three, four months of, of life. I think actually uh, that has to keep go on. And, um, you know, both, both uh, the father and mother should have the ability to take time off to, to be involved in bringing up the child. So I, I think the, the role of the father is incredibly important. Okay, right. I, I would like to uh, tell the word. I, I change diapers as well. So just in case <laughs> you're wondering, right? Some people do, but I do, okay? <laughs> right, uh, yeah, speaking on uh, Prof Chong, uh, listen, there's a technical question, Prof Chong, and so I'm going to read uh, directly. If 40% uh, of mothers in the study exhibit depressive or sub-depressive symptoms, is there in the study an over-representation of a high-risk group or has there been some form of self-selection should the baseline of diagnosis be reassessed too? Sure. So no, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, so uh, just to explain, the Gasto study uh, recruited uh, mothers from KK Hospital and National University Hospital uh, when they first booked for their uh, pregnancies. So basically, these are two public uh, maternity units. Uh, in Singapore, actually, almost two thirds of mothers go to the private care system. Um, so basically, the fact that we are only recruiting subjects from uh, the public maternity units means that probably we are not uh, getting the upper uh, half of uh, Singaporean uh, socioeconomic groups. So basically, what we have in, uh, in our Gusto study would be middle class, uh, maybe if over representation of the lower middle class uh, people. But they were not uh, special uh, high risk groups. Um, and basically, when we projected our findings to, you know, and compared it with the Singapore demographics, they were not too difficult, uh, not too different. In Gasto, we did over sample uh, the uh, Indians and Malays so that we could compare the differences between the three ethnic groups. So Gasto, to be very clear, is not a population sample of uh, Singapore. Right. Okay. So that, that, that's a good point. Uh, although um, I, uh, and we may have all had maybe a bit more uh, mothers with depressive symptoms, but I don't think we are very far off the mark based on uh, uh, you know, what we've seen uh, from subsequent uh, studies around the world, uh, in this part of uh, the world. Right, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof Chang. Um, we, and that, that question actually comes from uh, Ong Pao Sien. Um, another question comes from, uh, from Natalie, uh, Dr. Natalie Pang, uh, and this goes to Farid and Susanna. Over the years, there seems to be tensions emerging between generational cohorts. Like for example, people saying, okay, boomer, you know, hashtag okay, boomer, older generation, calling the younger people strawberries, blueberries, and whatnot, uh, snowflakes. Um, how do you think such intergenerational tension and tensions uh, may be addressed? 
Because previously we talked about race, right? But how do we talk about intergenerational tensions here? Uh, Farid, will you start first? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, um, I was just thinking whether Susanna might want to have a go because I've been talking a lot. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to go. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, in the work that I do, um, one of the principles uh, or foundational principles is the voice, the voices of the people that that need that, that need to be heard must be there. So we don't talk about oh those people and and they're not here today, but let's talk about them. Right, and so we try very hard to actually say if we're going to have this issue, let's make sure we have the voices of those people here as well, so they they, they are present. That's one, and that that that's the first step. The second step is just because they are that that can be a bit of a challenge, right? So and and the second thing is once they are present, for example, even if I do class or if I do age, uh, uh, socio-economic class, there could be perceived, how should I say, uh. It, the self, there are self-esteem issues that, that would arise from perceived differences. So, for example, the way I speak Singlish, or the way I use a bit more dialect or Hokkien, or the way I speak English in a, a bit more Englishy way, for want of a better word. You know, these are markers for class, right? And if this is not addressed, then you're going to have a pretty silent uh, a group that just sits there because, oh, I don't think I can speak English very well, and I'll throw in law Hokkien, and then how, uh, then... I, I think I, I'm not so uh, I'm not so smart lah, you know. So the facilitator needs to actually bring that elephant in the room and 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 and, and open it up and create that safe space. And the other thing is power differential as well. So let's say, for example, in this room, I've got a professor, I've got a doctor, I've got a politician, uh, and I've got you know migrant workers. If I don't address that elephant in a room, which is the power differential, we're not going to have authentic conversations. We're going to have a Q and A quest, a Q and A session. We're gonna have the people who are used to talking talking a lot, right? And so, uh, it is, with the with the thing with with uh, generational thing as well, we need to bring it in. So what I usually do is I say, "Wow, you know, look at this room. We've got so many different people of different um, backgrounds, you know." So uh, building trust. So what I always say is that whatever the content is, whatever we're trying to explore, the human need to connect is very strong. So our, the principle we use is connection before content, right? And that's important. Uh, and once, so creating that opportunity to build trust, that's important, the safe space. And then the second thing would be, wow, um, how, do, how do we begin to, uh, to have this conversation? You're 60, we've got 16 year olds here and we've got 75 year olds. If this is gonna be a really rich conversation and people don't feel paise or people don't feel shy, how can we address this? Huh? What, 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 what do you think, you know, Mr. So-and-so or so-and-so? And then they'll bring it up. Okay, let's just don't call me so Mr. So-and-so, you know, let's just, so you offer the participants to actually be part of the solution. Back to what you and, and John were saying. I, I think let's just don't look at age here for, for a second. Just see me as a person, right? And then when people hear that, I'll say, okay, uh, let's just forget about the fact that I'm a, uh, if I do interreligious dialogue, uh, that I'm a pastor or whatever. If there's content knowledge, yes, but I'm also a learning, a learner, a pilgrim in this, in this session. And so uh, I also want to learn from you who might be an atheist or might be a Muslim or who might be spiritual but not religious. So, so that's a way of actually trying to create that space so that the relationship is nurtured, the safe space is nurtured, uh, and, and of course the connections that happened before that, and so the skill of the facilitator, the ambiance that you create, uh, and, and the ability of the facilitator to get the, the conversations going between the participants and not like I'm the facilitator, you ask a question, I answer, and then you know, uh, yep, saying ask, I answer. Uh, so it's, it's trying to make almost making yourself redundant if things are great, and then they're having these conversations among themselves, and that's the thing that I aim for. So that's a bit of the strategies that I use. Uh, Susanna, over to you. Yeah, for, for us in COMSA, uh, as we have said, that it's about intergenerational solidarity. Um, and bonding. So we purposely actually uh, included a program that allows to have that platform. We introduced uh, a program called Curating Wampo. So it's about uh, utilizing the knowledge and the experience of older persons as, uh, as carriers of the history of Wampo as a community and then the stories behind those old objects. And then, so we purposely designed a program that allows that interaction to happen. 
And what we can see every time we create that platform, there's always that uh, synergy and there's always that excitement and interest among our older persons, as well as the younger persons. So there was one very interesting, the curating one poll, both of them, we facilitated a, a, a workshop whereby they co-created the exhib exhibition itself in terms of what what pictures uh, or they're gonna say, and then how the whole exhibition would look like. So it's about creating those intentionally and purposefully creating those uh, platforms for the interactions to happen because once it happens, they can find common interests, especially at the community level because the older persons have lived there for so long and the younger persons have a lot to share also about, and they are interested to know about it. So the two things that we have uh, managed to, to do an exhibition uh, that went around to all the community, we used the void deck as the, as the space for the, the exhibition is around food, which is uh, very much uh, uh, something uh, very easy for them to connect as well as uh, old objects and the history behind it. And I think that was powerful in our experience. So, so it's about that. It's, it's really being intentional and, and, and really creating those platforms for, for that interaction to happen. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Susanna. I'm, I'm uh, conscious of the time. We have about five, uh, five minutes more. Um, and we have a lot of uh, questions, uh, which kind of shows, you know, the kind of... Uh, interest in the topics that we're talking about and you know for those people you know while i might not be able to go through much uh, or any more of the questions if you're still interested to talk to some of our experts do contact them to find them i'm sure you can find uh, them on the internet and, and uh, connect and ask your questions uh, and also continue these conversations with your own friends outside uh, because there, there are a lot of lessons that can be uh, taken from here um, so i'll just ask this final question um, and it's uh, to so-called um, humanize uh, change making all of you guys have done change making for for many 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 years right i mean maybe there's too many minis but for many years right um what are some challenges that you guys have faced and and what are some of the so-called uh tips or hint or uh, that you can tell um uh those people who want to be change makers right like, like how how can you sort of inspire them to be change maker? what 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 can you tell them so I'll, I'll just go through anyone first, perhaps, uh, John? Yes. Um, it's, yeah. I would say that one of the important things is to be good at remembering when, when changes have taken place. So you need continuity in, 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 in the organization, long-term volunteers. And, and, and note down, re remember some way when something that you've, you've campaigned for, even if it's a small detail, has been won because for short people who are with you for a short term they may often feel very dispirited when they see what appears to be a lack of any progress they'll say nothing has been achieved nothing's being done nothing has changed and you can say yes something has changed and that's very good for morale so that's just one important tip i think um yeah do be, be patient do your research work um if you're going to put if you don't just be a critic of what's wrong, come up with alternatives that that establishes a much better basis for dialogue and for progress. Even if people disagree with you, you 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 you've moved everything onto a different footing. You you then have a basis for going forward. Um, so those are the things I would say. Prof Chong, do you have any last comments on that? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Shama. So um, you know, I started off talking about human potential, right? So um. Um, you know, in business, when they look at potential, uh, which is the important thing when trying to hire people, is uh, they, they identify in four characteristics. One is cur curiosity, two is insight, three is engagement, and four is determination. So I think if you want to make change, you've got to have these four characteristics. One is that you need to be curious enough to find out what, you know, to listen to other people's points of view. And then you have to have the insight to quickly understand the other people's points of view. And then you must be prepared to engage them uh, meaningfully and uh, convince them. And finally, to have determination. So like Susanna said, you don't stop until you, you, know, you get what you, you achieve what you started out to do. So I think those are the four things I would say, curiosity, insight, engagement, and determination. Thank you. Susanna? I think for me, uh, let me share two. One is about walking the talk. If we want change to happen, we should be able to show that change ourselves. If we want to empower somebody, 
we need to be empowered ourselves. And that is why when we say we're empowering the older persons and the community, we're starting with the older persons themselves because it's, it's about themselves first and then they can think about, uh, they can be uh, harnessed there. We can leverage on that in terms of, so that's walking the talk. And I think that was the challenge. And the, to me, the challenge is it's, it's very difficult yeah. to sustain that walking the talk. Sometimes it's like, especially in, in, in a team-based, multidisciplinary, uh, how do you maintain that quality and standard that you want excellence, innovation across the whole team in terms of walking the talk? There will be challenges. The second is really around, uh, to me, the, the fact that uh, I'm, not, I'm not an older person myself. And therefore, I can only best represent them based on evidence, based on what we have studied, but they are the best representatives of themselves. So therefore, we need to be able to humble, be humble enough to say that we are not here to help you or to, to kind of give you something, but we're actually here to journey and to co-create something with you, as long as you are willing to do that. And I think that's that's very important in change making, that humility as well as the patience uh, to be the to be the change that you want to see for uh, in others. Yeah. So at least humility and patience, that itself is quite difficult to even have, right? I mean, these are difficult qualities to have. Um, Farid. Yeah. What you, yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I'm just going to say that, you know, in my work, because I also teach civil society and civic literacy in schools. Uh, yeah. um, and it's surprising what uh, that our students don't understand what uh, they have no idea what civil society is, at least before they enter university. Uh, they struggle with it. You know, uh, they think it's something to do with civilian, and et cetera, et cetera. But essentially, the idea that a, a group of citizens or residents uh, organize themselves to actually influence uh, government or society to make it a better place. Very simple definition. And I think that is something Singaporeans and people who live in Singapore need to reclaim or start being more comfortable with. I think we are very afraid as a society, as a community. We don't know where the OB markers are or whether they shift or whatever. We're very comfortable with community service, but advocacy work, oh, maybe not quite, not sure, data I cannot whack or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So, so and I, I think, but there has been a lot of change in this area over the last three, four years, you know, uh, and so my, my uh, and, and young people stepping up, they don't even register their organizations, they get their funding, through crowdfunding and they just just get up and do things you know which includes uh, advocacy work as well so i would encourage number one uh for for you to actually see what's what what's great about this society what needs to change what rocks your boat and do it right and uh not to have a binary approach oh good and bad black and white light and dark you know it's a spectrum oh you're against you're not with us you're against us you know and then there are allies everywhere to be made it's not just you and so there are allies within government within agencies within not-for-profits and allies everywhere so look for the allies right uh, and those are a few things I would just like to 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 to, um, to highlight uh, and which includes writing and meeting your member of parliament. You know, it's a democracy, right? And says, you know, I'm interested in climate change, Mr. MP so and so, Miss MP so and so. What's your policy on this? What can I expect in the next couple of years? You know, and I think that's going to be making Singapore a more vibrant place. Uh, and, and you you get uh, you, you articulate what you need and you want from your representative, right? Who you vote for. Uh, and so these are some things that I think we that could help us go forward. Thank you. Well, panelists, uh, Farid, Prof Chong, Susanna, John, thank you so much for giving us your time. I think we've talked about uh, experiential learning. We've talked about how research can inform and change our lives from a very young age. Uh, we've talked about piloting uh, projects in neighborhoods and low wage uh, workers. We've talked about a host of, of, of things, each probably deserving a few hours uh, <laughs> um, uh, time and attention. Now, um, to catch the other parts of this forum on change makers in Singapore, please save the following dates. Tuesday, 17 August 2021, 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. We're going we're gonna to have a forum on sustainability and livability. Uh, another one will be on the 31st of August, uh, a Tuesday, 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. This forum will be on corporate policies and culture. And of course, before we go, uh, as my uh, the events team will always remind me, um, we'll like to hear your views on the event. So if there's a link, uh, so there's a link, sorry, available on the Facebook comments, uh, just click it and submit your feedback. Um, 
we like to hear your views. So, so thank you, thank you, everyone, and uh, be safe out there. Thanks, Shamil. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. It was lovely. It's so enjoyable. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.